I know that I've learned an incredible amount from speaking with so many great guests over the past six months. And so this episode will be all about the most important takeaways and how we can use this knowledge to be better investors and in our own investment strategy going forward. I really hope you enjoy today's year end episode. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Millennial Investing Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Rebecca Hotsko. And for today's episode, it's going to be a little bit different. It's just me because I wanted to do an end of the year recap of 2022 and go over what happened in markets and share some of my biggest learnings and takeaways from the guests that I've had on this year. So to kick things off today, I wanted to start off by running through a recap of the market, go over the best and worst performing sectors to get a sense of where we are today. What's been really interesting about this year is that on an average basis, it looks like it wasn't too bad. But really, when we dive into the data on an industry level, the average is being pushed up by the energy sector in terms of price performance and earnings growth, where if the energy sector was excluded from the index, the total earnings for the S&P 500 index would actually have declined by almost 2% rather than the 5% growth that is expected. So the market as a whole has really been driven by energy, which isn't a surprise to many of us. We've heard this from lots of guests on the show. But jumping into this in a bit more detail, I think it's an interesting thought experiment to look back and see what assets and sectors performed well during this high inflation, high interest rate, low growth environment, and see if that matches up to the assets that typically are expected to perform well during these times. So if we start with the best performing sectors, which was energy, it was up more than 40% for the year on a relative basis. And this sector is expected to report earnings growth of 151.7% for the year, which is the highest out of all the 11 sectors by far. So a couple things to note on this. So the outperformance in the energy sector was really driven by these higher energy prices because of the rebound in demand post-pandemic. And at the same time, producers had limited ability to ramp up production after shutting in due to COVID, which constrained supply. And then this imbalance was further exasperated by the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which caused energy prices to spike to multi-year highs and global gas prices actually spiked to all-time highs. And so these higher energy prices were obviously very positive for these companies and was the main driver of this massive outperformance for the sector and that crazy increase in earnings growth. Now, are these really high prices expected to persist? We're already currently down significantly from the highs where WTI was trading well over $100. Now it's back to a more normal range in the high 70s. And so this gets into the first investment theme I wanted to touch on today, which is one of the most common investment strategies I've heard from guests that I've had on which is that we're likely entering a new commodity bull cycle. And so back to the prices, even if we enter a recession that would likely reduce the demand for oil in the near term. So we might not see prices skyrocket back to where they were in the near term. But at these prices, companies are still doing amazing. And so even if prices stay at these lower levels, energy companies are still cash flowing machines. And this is well above their break even. But since energy has been such a high performer over the past year, it has gotten more expensive compared to history with the run up in prices. And so I had to ask the question if it is too late to join the energy train. Is it now overvalued since we saw this massive appreciation over the past year? And so I had to ask this question to a few of my guests. And here is what Louis Gov had to say about that. Now, I don't think energy is overvalued, not by a long shot. I look at things like the coal miners in the U.S., for example, are trading at two, three times earnings. They're buying back 10% of their shares a year. They're far, far, far from being undervalued. They're overvalued, far, far, far from being over. And same story with a lot of the oil, oil companies. I mean, if you look, you're based in Canada. If you look at some of the Canadian oil stocks, you take a tourmaline, you take a, um, a Suncor. These are not expensive stocks. 
These are actually cash flow generating machines. Now, historically, and this is what makes it for me, energy particularly interesting this, in this cycle. Historically, you know, your typical oil company CEO, when he gets money, the first thing he does is he goes drill a hole in the desert because otherwise you wouldn't be an oil CEO. You know, that's what they do. Get money, drill holes. Here, all of a sudden, this the, your oil company CEO, he's no, nobody's drilling. Nobody's doing any capital spending. And the reason he's not drilling is because he's got governments telling him in five years, I want you out of business. So, you know, why is he going to do a big capital spending plan that comes due in three years? Why is he going to build a new refinery? Why is he going to build pipelines? He can't even get environmental approval for it. So now he gets, he's generating amazing cash flows and he really has no choice but to give these cash flows back to shareholders, either through special dividends or through share buybacks. So that is the first big investment theme and strategy that I wanted to cover today because this is an industry where I will be watching closely as prices start to go down in the first half of the year, then I see that as a good opportunity to add more to my positions. So that's energy. Now I want to move on to the other sectors. So the rest of the 10 sectors were down when looking at a one-year relative performance. Some were pretty close to flat, like utilities and consumer defensive held up pretty well. But let's talk about the absolute worst performing sectors of the year. So coming in first is the communication sector, which includes companies like Google and Meta. And this sector as a whole is down about 40% for the year. And the sector is expected to report a 14.7% decline in earnings for the year. So this isn't necessarily news to us. We know how badly these stocks have been beaten up over the year. And at the company level, Google, Meta and Warner Bros are the largest contributors to this expected earnings decline for the sector. And if these three companies were excluded, the sector would actually be expected to report positive earnings growth of 1.3% rather than the decline of nearly 15%. Now, the second worst performer for the year was the consumer discretionary or consumer cyclical sector, which includes companies like Amazon, Etsy, eBay. And this sector is down 36% this year and is expected to report a decline in earnings of about 14%. And at the company level, Amazon is the largest contributor to the expected earnings decline for the sector. If Amazon was excluded, the sector would actually be expected to report positive earnings growth of nearly 15% rather than a decline of almost 14%. And then the third worst performing sector is technology, which includes companies like Apple, Adobe, and this sector is down 31% for the year. But the earnings growth for this sector actually held up and is expected to be positive at 3.9% for the year. So that wraps up what happened. But now that it's 2023, with the knowledge that things are likely going to get worse in 2023, where it's likely that earnings still need to downgrade about 20, 30%, and the Fed is still expected to hike rates and communicated potentially reaching 5.25% by the end of 23 or until something breaks and they're forced to pivot. It begs the question of how should we be thinking about investing in this environment? Should we be buying the dip or should we be remaining more defensive as it's likely that there is more pain ahead? But at the same time, we won't know when the Fed is actually going to pivot, when markets are going to rebound. And so what do we do as prudent investors in this scenario? Well, I asked this question to my guest, Louis Gov in episode 235, and this is what he had to say. So I think bear markets are there for a reason. They're not fun, obviously. Nobody, you know, we all like bull markets better. They're a lot more exciting. Bear markets are there for a reason. Big bear markets, like the ones where, because we are now in a big bear market. This is not a correction. Corrections, you buy the dip. Bear markets, what you do in a bear market is you wonder where is the next leadership going to come from? I think the tendency of most investors when they're in a bear market is to hold on to the past cycles winners, to say, oh, you know what? I bought Peloton here, or I bought Zoom communications here, or I bought Facebook there, and it's going to come back because these are good companies and they're going to come back over time. 
But the reality is bear markets are there for a reason, and that's to change leadership from one group of stock to the next. So while you're in a bear market, what you should actually be doing is thinking, okay, where is the next leadership going to come from? And the best way to do that is to actually look at within, while you're going to the bear market, who is already outperforming? Who's already starting to shine? And today I would say there's, there's really two asset classes that are starting to shine. The first asset class is energy. Pretty much anything linked to energy has been outperforming. And the second asset class that's been uh, outperforming is emerging markets, especially if you exclude China, which is such a big part of the emerging market benchmark. But if you look at your Brazils, your Indias, your Indonesias, your South Africas, your Mexicos, all these markets are flat up for the year, which is dumbfounding. In an environment of rising interest rates, of strong US dollar, that these markets are actually flat to up for the year goes against any historical precedence. I think there's a very strong message in both the outperformance of energy, you know, energy outperforming during an economic slowdown and in the emerging market outperformance. To me, it tells me that the next bull market will focus on those two, maybe both or either of these, or at least one of these two sectors. So in these two sectors, I want to buy the dip. You know, when I see energy dipping, yep, I'll buy that. But the reality is you're wasting your time and more importantly, you're wasting your capital if you're still hoping for the turnaround in Zoom, the turnaround in Facebook, the turnaround in Tesla. That ship has sailed. It's gone. That was the previous bull market. The current bear market does mark the end of that bull market. Think about what the next bull market is going to be. It's not going to be in the same place. It never is. Lightning never strikes twice in the same area. So I wanted to include this clip again from Louis because I think his message is so important to remember for this coming year and for our strategies going forward where we might have to think differently about what's going to become the biggest winners in this next bull cycle. And we can't just hold on to the past winners and hope for the rebound in their performance because they did so well in the past. And thinking about the biggest winners in the last bull market was really these big tech stocks. And at the same time, though, these are the stocks that have been beaten down the most over the year, where Apple stock has lost about 18 percent, while Alphabet or Google has declined about 40 percent. Amazon has fallen 45 percent and Meta has plunged over 70 percent. And so while I think in general, it seems reasonable to believe that there is going to be the secular changes and trends about who will be the biggest winners going forward. It's not to say that all of these stocks were the previous best performers are going away or not going to perform well. And so I was wondering, are some of these big tech names beaten down too much to ignore at this point? And so I had on Logan Kane, which is episode 239 where he did a deep dive on these technology stocks, including Apple and Google. And he talks about how despite Apple has held up the best out of all the big tech companies, he believes Apple is the most overvalued tech stock of them all. And so here's the clip on Logan's analysis of Apple. Apple stock is probably the most overvalued large cap stock, or barring Amazon or Tesla right now. So I'll start our discussion of Apple with a couple of anomalies on the financial markets. The first is the disposition effect, which has historically kept Apple cheap. What would happen is Apple would go up, but it would always remain cheap, the stock. Pretty much any time from 2010 to 2018, the stock was always cheap, but it had gone up in excess of 20% a year. I mean, depending on the time period, 30 plus percent per year. That's because, you know, people, they get a million dollars for investing in Apple and they go buy a boat or they buy a house and it, it keeps the stock down and it creates momentum. But this position effect creates momentum on stocks, which is another good anomaly to know about. Stocks that go up tend to keep going up. Stocks that go down, they tend to keep going down. It's an old, like, uh, it's old folk wisdom on Wall Street, but it's absolutely true. But what happened with Apple, something changed around, I don't know, maybe the summer of 2019. And this changed for a lot of stocks and for the market at large. And is that the Fed and the Treasury kind of coordinated to juice the economy. And this massive asset price bubble started. Really wasn't that bad in 2019. But for reference, Christmas Eve 2018 on the market bottoms, I think it was Christmas Eve. I think Apple was like 10 or 12 times earnings um, on a forward basis, incredibly cheap. And by the peak 
in a fourth quarter of 2021, it was like 40 times earnings. I mean, that's just like, that's obscene. How can the same company, their net income was basically flat over, I mean, you know, they bought back share, so the EPS went up. The business was the same, but the stock was worth four times as much. So if that is an evidence of some craziness in the market, inefficiency, if you will, that I don't know what is. So basically with Apple is the profit from the business has stayed roughly flat and grown a little. This was until the pandemic. And then the, with the stimulus, a lot of customer or a lot of consumers got all this money and they couldn't go travel. They couldn't do live entertainment. So they just slammed Apple with orders for iPhones and Apple's profits like skyrocketed. But this is not sustainable going forward. It's not sustainable to put a very high multiple on that going forward. And as a result, Apple stock is probably the most overvalued large cap stock or barring Amazon or Tesla right now. I think if you just close your eyes, block out the stock price with Apple and say, what would a company making this amount of money be worth? I think per share, I think you would get a price of somewhere between 75 and $95 a share. It was trading for almost 180 earlier this year. Now, I wanted to share that clip because I just really like the way Logan analyzes companies and his thought process, but he doesn't think that it's all doom and gloom for the tech stocks. And he also shares in the episode why he thinks Google is the most undervalued tech stock and is a great buy anywhere under $90 per share. And so here's a clip of Logan's analysis of why he likes Google's stock. Okay, so for Google, I like Google. I don't like Apple. The reason why I like Google is because Google is projected to have double digit rates of growth for the next five, seven, 10 years. And the reason why I feel that is just the structural advantages that Google has with search, with the internet, with just the way as the world develops, Google is like, it's like a toll booth in a lot of ways. And Apple is too, but when you look at the consensus analyst estimates for growth, I mean, Google's around 15% a year for the next three years. The, their earnings are coming down this year off of last year because no COVID boom, ad, advertising dependent. But Google is cheaper than Apple from a price to earnings perspective, but the growth is projected to be two to three times as much. Moreover, Google spends a lot of money in R&D and not that Apple doesn't. But Google spends so much money on R&D that it makes the company look less profitable than it is. So what you really get with Google is just a cash machine. And Google is really the cash machine that Apple would like to be. It's so much less visible. I and mean, you can see this looking at the returns over time. Like Google has always been more steady. Google's money comes from businesses. Even though everybody uses the product, their money comes from businesses. Apple's money comes from consumers. You go to the Apple store and be like, how, how busy is the Apple store? Like, well, maybe we should buy some Apple stock. So people have a tendency to invest in consumer discretionary stocks at a disproportionate rate. So I'll go into more of why I like Google. I think if you buy now, I think you get sufficient compensation for owning the stock over a five-year period. And I define sufficient compensation as 10% annual returns or greater. If you can get it cheaper, get it cheaper. I mean, anything under 90 is pretty good. Um, anything under 80, I think would be an absolute steal. I also asked him what he thinks about Google going forward because its business-driven revenue might slow down more if we hit a recession and businesses can't spend as much money on advertising and such things like that. And so here's what he had to say about how he's thinking about these near-term risks. So Google and companies like it are kind of an early warning sign for a slowing economy. Google is not a recession-proof stock. If I have a business and I think a recession is coming, advertising is one of the first things I'm going to cut. That's, that's just how it is. So Google right now is they're going to see their earnings decline. So when I wrote my article on Google, I gave the earnings estimates a haircut. I said, I don't think these are going to hit in year one, but I think they're going to be better than you think in year two, year three, year four. And that's just because the economy is going to slow down and at some point it's going to bottom out and it's going to come back up. It's cyclical. But if you look over the cycle at the earnings power of Google, I find it's far superior to Apple. Another question is compensation. Almost all businesses have their problems. But if I can buy a stock for 10 times earnings or 15 times earnings, those problems aren't so bad. If I'm paying 80 times earnings for a stock, a very small problem for the business is a very big problem for the stock. We need second order thinking to do well in the stock market. It's not, if it were only a matter of saying, give me the best businesses and just buy them. It'd be really easy. You just go out, you say, hey, the store's really busy. Um, I'm going to invest in this stock. But the valuation is like a point spread in this way. 
because the those earnings can be paid out as dividends to investors that can be reinvested in the business that can be used to buy back stock. In a lot of companies' case, they do all three. So I think if you gave me a pick of a business, like do you want Google or do you want Apple? I think I would still choose Google regardless of value. Like if the valuations were equal, I think I would still choose Google. But if the valuation for Apple were cheaper, I would like Apple. I would be all over Apple if it was under like, I don't know, $85, $80 a share. I'd be all over it. And the second major investment theme I want to talk about today is mean reversion. This is one of the most important lessons I learned from speaking with guests over this year because mean reversion exists in markets and in industries. It's most commonly known as the boom and bust cycles within an economy or the different market cycles of the stock market. But even more than that, mean reversion also has really important impacts on companies' profitability and overall returns we can get as investors where it tends to pull down companies earning higher than average profits and higher than average return on invested capital back down to its mean. And it pulls up companies who have recently performed poorly and it pushes them back up to its historical mean. And that's why the biggest losers tend to be the biggest gainers in the future. And so I had a few different guests talk about this in a few different contexts. And I want to start with Michael Gayad, who is one of the first people I interviewed. And he had this to say about mean reversion. So there's a um, well-known phenomenon called the Morningstar curse, which basically says that if you were to take the top performing funds, top performing strategies over the last three years, the five star funds, And then look at how they behave the next three years and end up being that those top performing funds end up being among the worst performing funds in the next three years. Conversely, same is the same is also true, meaning that the worst performing strategies and funds over the last five years or three years end up being oftentimes in the top decile for the next three, five years. In other words, there's a degree of mean reversion, right? That happens with strategies which are hot for a moment and then go cold and then cold goes to hot, right? Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. In many ways, Sometimes the best investments are the ones that have done the absolute worst over the last several years, which is just a way of thinking about another way of framing buy low, sell high, right? The problem is FOMO often screws with people's heads, right? They want to chase that which is going up and they think they can trade it and get out just as the turn is about to happen. And all the evidence suggests that that's not true, but you have much more room for error. You have much more cushion, obviously, with things which have already done so poorly where not too many people are trying to chase. It's a long-winded answer, but my point here is that sometimes I often advocate that people should consider allocating to that which has not done well at all. By the way, like energy stocks, okay, which you know have been on fire, they've done poorly for a decade. But if you follow that at that suggestion that maybe the best thing to do is buy the the biggest laggards over the last cycle over the last several years, well, at some point, mean inversion kicks in. At some point, you end up having that which is last become first and first last. So I wanted to reshare these clips with you all today and include mean reversion as one of my biggest topics and takeaways from the guests I've spoken with because it has so many important implications of what assets to buy. And it goes back to that contrarian mindset as well as how to be a good value investor, which is something that I learned more about after speaking with Tobias Carlyle on episode 241. Because at first, the concept of mean reversion sounds so counterintuitive to me, where Toby explained how buying the losers tend to work out better than buying winners who are posting strong and growing profits over time for the simple fact that they tend to mean revert. But how this relates back to being a great value investor and just investor in general is that there's an exception to this, which is if a company has a sustainable competitive advantage Warren Buffett calls it a moat, then it is way more likely that this company can continue to earn these high rates of return on invested capital, high return on equity over time, and it won't necessarily mean revert. And this is where it all just started really clicking to me and why Warren Buffett really stresses the need for companies to have this element. He spends so much time talking about competitive advantages, why they're important, and why it's so important to look for these in the companies you're investing in, especially if they're these high growth companies. And so Toby touches on this in our episode and makes some really great points on why it's so hard to find companies with these sustainable competitive advantages. And so here is what he had to say about that. 
One of the problems is that over time, the market evolves and things that were regarded as being moats in the past are not that way. There are lots and lots of businesses that look like they have moats. Once the moat is crossed and all of that ability to generate, once the competitive advantage is eliminated and that ability to generate the supernormal returns is gone, then it's very unlikely that they get it back again in the future. But you're often paying a premium price for those supernormal returns. So one of the exercises, this is sort of built into my models, but one of the exercises that I do is if you have something that's earning, say, two times more than the average. So the average company in the S&P 500 earns about 13.3% return on invested capital. And so if you find a business that's earning more than that, you know that you've got, potentially you've got a special kind of business that it's able to earn higher returns than normal. But you can see if that special business has a higher return than normal, then it's also worth more than normal. And so it should trade at a premium to the average PE in the S&P 500, which might be around 19 times right now, something like that. People might buy that thinking that they can generate good returns going forward if they can sustain this high return on invested capital, because it is true that the longer you hold, the closer your own investment return, it trends towards the return on invested capital. So over the short period of time, your return is dictated by the multiple that you pay. But over time, it becomes the return on invested capital. So the reason that that's important is if we also know that businesses have this tendency to mean revert, so the return on invested capital drops, it makes sense that say it's earning two times the average business and it's worth two times on a multiple basis. If in 10 years time, it's earning the same amount as the average business, it's also going to be only worth the same amount as the average business. So if I've paid twice the multiple, and over 10 years, the multiple mean reverts down to the market multiple. What are the chances that I've actually made money over that period of time? And it turns out that often it's pretty low. 10 years for, for mean reversion in most businesses, that's about right. That's about how long it takes on average. Other than this very small portion, other than about 4% that earn these super normal returns forever and ever. You can think about that. Michael Moberson does this research all the time where he brings out, here are the businesses that were able to earn super normal returns over the last decade. And it's backwards looking. What are the chances that those are the same businesses in 10 years' time? It's very low. And often the best kind of investment opportunities are not the ones that have the super normal returns on equity. It's just the ones that are doing a little bit better than average. And they might be, you know, the companies that make up is a great business. Some of the, the businesses like that where they've got a little bit of recession protection built into them that when, when times get really tough, people will still go and they can justify going and buying expensive lipstick because it's a small purchase. Whereas they might not, go, might not go and buy a Tesla when times are really bad. So they have a little bit of this inbuilt protection in them. And people are quite habitual. They like their brand. So if they like a particular brand, they tend to, it's just easy to keep on going and buying that same brand. So you want to take advantage of those kinds of behaviors, things that will survive through a recession because getting a zero on anything that you're invested in is catastrophic. You should assume that you're going to get some, but you should always keep everything small enough so it won't hurt. And then looking for things where there is that habit and repeatability. So Starbucks is a great example. We all know that coffee is addictive. People who like their coffee, it's a little treat that you can get once or twice a day. That's a great habit. Starbucks is one of those businesses that has earned very high returns for most of its life. So it's funny, it's not the businesses that are the superstars that tend to be the ones that really do manage to sustain these high returns. It's businesses that you might overlook them a little bit because they're so, they're ubiquitous, they're common. You see them everywhere all the time and they're just sort of part of a landscape, but they are the ones that do tend to generate sustainable high returns and invest capital over time. But you also have to be careful. You have to bear in mind that at any point in time, they can mean revert back down to an average business. And so you should buy them with that in mind where if they do sustain those high returns and invest capital, you generate this great return. If they don't, you're still going to get roughly a market return. Now that wraps up my investment theme number two on mean reversion. And now the next biggest lesson I want to talk about came from something Logan Kane said on how to become a better investor. So there's this thing, it's called the fundamental law of active management. To be a good investor, you either need to be able to make a lot of bets at a low percentage, like if you could win 51% on a thousand bets, or you could be Warren Buffett and you could win, I don't know, 80, 90% on 10 bets. There's really no right way to go about it. Like business, like life, there's multiple ways to do it. And one of the great things about investing in business is there's literally a million ways you can do it. What I like and what I think is the easiest is to take more of a quantitative approach. 
you can always do some value investments as they come up. But what I like about the quantitative approach is it takes a lot of our biases out of the way. Like we might think Apple's a great stock, but the computer might look at it and it might say, oh, you know, at Apple's 30, 40 times earnings, people are kind of excited about it, but you know, you don't really see it. If you want to be a value investor or you want to be like Buffett, um, there's a very important trap that a lot of beginning and intermediate and even professional investors fall into. What it's known as is the disposition effect. So the tendency is if we make a portfolio and we invest in 100 stocks, So over time, our human tendency is to hold on to the losers and try to get them back to even. And we sell the winners. Now, research shows that this costs investors, I've seen 4% a year up to six, sometimes even 7% a year. And this one effect has been shown to account for a lot of the mutual fund underperformance versus the S&P 500. So the nice thing about these quant funds, like, and a lot of these are just ETFs, is they automatically hold the winners and they automatically dump the losers. But this is a huge advantage. And so back to the fundamental law of active management, there's only two ways to be a better investor. You have to make better forecasts or you have to be able to use those forecasts on a wider number of stocks and investments. I personally, I mean, I know my own limitations. I mean, I consider myself pretty smart, but I'm not like, I'm not that smart. You know, so it's a lot easier and it's a lot more low hanging fruit to increase the diversification rather than to know everything about a handful of stocks and constantly stay on top of them. So what I really like about his point here and why I wanted to include it as one of my biggest lessons for this episode is that there are so many different strategies to make money in the market. And really these two ways to become better investors Neither is better. It comes down to your preference and which you enjoy more. Do you feel like you have an edge in investing in certain businesses? Do you enjoy doing fundamental analysis and diving deep into companies? Or are you someone who likes investing, but you don't want to spend a whole lot of time on individual companies? And so I want to jump into both of these strategies more in detail because I've had on guests that talk about both on the show. And so if you are someone who loves the value investing side of things and you want to pick companies, maybe you follow a Warren Buffett style value investing strategy. Well, I wanted to include my top takeaways of how to become a better value investor from Robert Hegstrom, who is an expert in the space. He has written several books on Buffett and he gave us some great advice and his top tips on how we can become better value investors, how Warren Buffett thinks about investing and the top things that we can take from his strategy and apply to our own. And so here is my clip with Robert Hegstrom on the most important things to becoming a better value investor. Well, I I think it can be summarized very simply and is that Warren has a totally different orientation to the stock market than what I observe 99% of the people do. By that, I think too many people spend too much time trying to guess stock prices and what stock prices will do in the short term. And Warren doesn't think about the market in that way. He thinks about stock prices as being businesses, and he's more focused on what's going on with the business, the economics of the business. And the stock price is, is almost an afterthought. He just doesn't spend a whole lot of time thinking about markets, stock prices, sectors, things like that. He just wants to be a business owner and isolate some really great businesses for his portfolio. And that's where he spends the vast majority of his time as being a business investor, not a stock picker. And I think the other thing I want to point out here is regardless if you want to be a Warren Buffett type value investor, there is still a ton we can learn from Buffett and the way he invests. The first is how to think of stocks as businesses and from a business owner mentality. And then from there, Warren looks at what are the major tenants or things you would look for in a business if you are looking at it from this business owner perspective. So having this framework in mind, I think regardless of which approach you're taking can help you become a better stock picker with any strategy that you're trying to implement. And so here are the four tenants that Robert talks about each business needs to make for him to invest in it. And we like to buy uh, you know, businesses that are simple and understandable that have, you know, good, favorable long-term prospects. And I went, ah, business tenants, check. And, you know, we like companies that generate a lot of cash, earn high returns on capital, high high profit margins. Oh, financial tenants, check. I got that part right. 
We want management that thinks independently, that's rational about how they allocate capital. Check. They got the management part right. And then lastly, oh, we always buy them below intrinsic value. And I said, oh, that's, that's exactly the Warren Buffett way. This is perfect. Then I would look at their portfolio. There's two parts. It is thinking about stocks as businesses. Then if you're a business owner, how would you think about a collection of businesses? If you had great businesses, you wouldn't want to trade them all the time. If you had great businesses, you'd want to hang on to them because that's what's, you know, growing your net worth over time. So those are kind of the two parts of the Warren Buffett approach, a stock selection approach and a portfolio management approach. So the last key theme I want to touch on regarding value investing or just stock picking is how do you know how concentrated to go as Warren was very concentrated in his positions? And even more than that, how do you decide if this is the right strategy for you at all? And so here's a clip of some insights that Robert shares on this. Well, I think that's it's an excellent question, and I think you've kind of got the boundaries around it quite right. So let's go back. If, if you can actually analyze companies and you think about them as businesses, you understand the cash, you understand the return on capital, you understand the competitive advantage period, how long this will last. You can actually do you know cash flow analysis and do dividend discount models, which are all you know by the time you're a freshman in college, you've got that stuff figured out. If you can do that. Then really, it's in your best interest to own fewer stocks, not more stocks, because you're basically concentrating your bets on those things that have the highest probability of generating, you know, high returns over time. If you don't have that confidence or you don't have that insight about businesses and how to think about valuation and stuff like that, as, as Warren says, you're a know-nothing investor, then you want to diversify. Warren said there's nothing wrong with indexing. You know, it actually outperforms the vast majority of active managers. And so there's nothing wrong with it. You've just got to align your portfolio with your skill set. And if you said, if you do have the skills to think about stocks as businesses and do good in analysis, owning fewer stocks and holding them longer term is better than owning lots of stocks and turning them over. But if you don't know, you know, if you're not a good business analyst, you don't have that confidence level, then you certainly, you certainly want to probably diversify. So I wanted to include this particular clip because I love what Robert says here, where it's best to align your portfolio with your skill set and be realistic about what your skill set is. Because as he mentioned, most active strategies actually tend to underperform passive strategies over the long run. And so if you're an investor who is buying stocks because you think that is the best way to generate higher than market returns... All the evidence points to the fact that that actually isn't true over the long term. And it's because of the simple fact that this is so hard to do consistently. And so I had a guest on, Larry Swedro, who shared some really interesting research on this topic. Today now, and I wrote a book called The Incredible Shrinking Alpha with my friend Andy Bergen, showed why it's actually getting harder and harder to outperform the market. Then those numbers are down to 2% and 1% after taxes or so. And that was as far back as 10 years ago. So it's probably even less today. Here's the way to think about it. The people who are engaged in active investing certainly have the chance to win that game. Can't rule it out. But the odds of doing so are so poor that obviously the prudent strategy is to choose not to play it. The stock market, if you just bought and owned the market and reinvested any dividends over time, you would have gotten about a 10% return. Now, if you ask people, you know, if you bought an individual stock, what percent of them outperform? Most people would think, well, it's probably 50-50, and it's nowhere near that. Far fewer stocks beat the market than people think. In fact, here's a number that's probably going to shock you, Rebecca, even though you've read my books, which is this. If you look at the excess return of stocks over treasury bills, that's called the risk premium for equities, right? So you should earn an excess return for taking that risk. Only 4% of all the stocks, 1 in 25, account for 100% of all the excess return of stocks. Now, what are the odds you're going to find those stocks and hold them for the entire time to make sure you capture those gains? Here, most stocks underperform the market. And therefore, as you add more stocks to your portfolio, you're increasing the chances of getting the median return and the mean return for stocks. 
So you own a few stocks, which is unfortunately what most people tend to do or individual investors. You have, do have a chance to hit that home run and find the next Google or Microsoft, but the odds are greatly against you. And unfortunately, all the research on individual investors show that the vast majority of them underperform. In fact, the stocks that they buy on average go on to underperform after they buy them, and the stocks they sell go on to outperform after they sell them. Of course, since there's zero-sum game, someone's on the other side. Turns out it's the smarter institutional investors who are exploiting dumb retail money. So I really like this conversation with Larry, and I wanted to include this clip because I think he makes some really great points on why it's so hard to beat the market for the average investor and why it's so hard to do it consistently. And if you're an investor who thinks, well, I don't know if I have the skill to pick the 4% of stocks that have historically made up all of the excess returns, or if you're just realistic with yourself and you know your limitations as an investor, you aren't out of luck and you don't have to just accept market returns. There are other strategies that you can implement and still do very well and even beat the market. And this goes back to what Logan said about the fundamental law of active management, where you either have to make better forecasts or you can use those forecasts on a wider range of stocks. And so the latter is talking about a more quantitative approach where you're just saying, I want to spread my bets. I don't really know what's going to happen in the future, but I do know what characteristics typically do better over time. And so I'm just going to buy a lot of them. And so I brought on Toby Carlisle on episode 242 to talk about his acquires multiple strategy, which is a quantitative deep value approach. And what's really great about it is it removes the need for you to be a superior business analyst and pick the right company. And what's even more interesting is that Toby shows through his back test that his strategy has actually outperformed Warren Buffett's strategy of buying wonderful companies at a fair price. And so here's the clip with Toby talking about his strategy versus Warren Buffett's. Buffett is well known for, he's a value investor, first of all. So that means that he's trying to identify companies that are trading for less than they're worth and then to buy them with the idea that over time, mean reversion takes the underlying value to the price or vice versa, the price to the value. He has said many times that given that value is a very broad church, there's a lot of different ways that you can invest in value. And what Buffett is looking for is a company that grows over time. You're getting the improvement in the, in the intrinsic value at the same time that you're hoping for the discount between the price that you pay and the intrinsic value to close. And so what he has said is that he looks for wonderful companies at fair prices. So he defines a wonderful company as a company that has a high return on invested capital. So that's the amount of money that the company earns scaled by the amount of money that it has that is invested in the business to generate those returns. It's not a simple process to say we're just going to buy wonderful businesses, fair prices. If you're looking for a simple approach, a quantitative approach, it's better to say we're going to try and buy fair companies at wonderful prices, which is to say, let's just say we have no ability to figure out how high quality these businesses are. For the most part, that does seem to be the case. Statistically, historically, it's extremely difficult to find sustained high returns on invested capital. I think I've often said that it, it looks like it's about 4% of businesses statistically, quantitatively have this sustained high returns on invested capital. I saw Charlie Munger is reported to have asked this question of one of the, the Ted, Ted or Todd, one of the guys who invests, one of the newer guys at Berkshire who's investing in Berkshire Capital. And they said, he asked them, what percentage of businesses do you think will be better in five years' time? What percentage of S&P 500 businesses? And so it was Todd. His response was, I think it's about 5% of businesses. And Munger said it's about 2% of businesses. And so what my response is 4% of businesses, I think that sits about halfway between the two. Statistically speaking, that's about the case. So what we're saying is, if we have no ability to predict what the future is going to look like, and it does seem to be that there is some evidence that that is in fact the case. Nobody really knows what's going to happen. If you don't know what's going to happen, then you want to get as many factors on your side. If you have a good outcome and you've paid modestly for a business, you tend to have an outsized return in the market. If you have a bad outcome for a company that you paid up for, you have an outsized return in the other direction. So basically what my approach is just to say, 
let's be honest about what we do know and what we don't know. How do we protect ourselves in those circumstances? And the way that I say that you can protect yourself is by paying as little as possible and not trying to work out which really are the better businesses or otherwise, because you'll find that it's quite confounding. It's quite hard to sort of predict these things into the future. At least that's, that's what my research shows. So another strategy that is somewhat similar to Toby's approach is factor investing. And the reason I say it's similar is because this is a quantitative approach that involves using specific characteristics of stocks, such as value stocks, high quality, high profitability, and momentum to improve your expected returns over time. So I did a whole mini episode on what factor investing is, which is episode 219 if you haven't listened to it yet. And here's a clip from my interview with Larry Swedro talking all about what factor investing is. The research, and I wrote a book called Your Complete Guide to Factor-Based Investing, and that really showed that there are certain traits or characteristics. That's what a factor means. It's a trait or a characteristics. Large stocks are companies that have high market capitalizations, like the stocks in the S&P 500. And then you could have small stocks that may have a valuation in the $100 million range. You have value stocks, which are cheap stocks. They treat them low PEs or growth stocks, which are defined as high PE stocks. Warren Buffett had been telling investors for decades that he beat the market because he bought cheap stocks that were more profitable and they were higher quality. They didn't have a lot of volatility in their earnings not a lot of leverage on their balance sheet. So academics went in and reverse engineered that. Of course, it took them 50 years to figure out what Buffett had been telling people for decades. But eventually they found this. Let's see if we can identify what the stocks are that Buffett says you should buy. And if we can identify that there are common traits, then we can just buy an index of those stocks or create an index of them. And we don't have to do any research into that. Or is it that Buffett's a great stock picker? Now, most people would say Buffett was a great stock picker. Research says that's not true. Buffett's genius was he identified these traits well before others. And in that first book, at the time, academics had identified two factors or traits that allowed you over time to outperform the market. And they were value, so by cheap and buy smaller stocks. So the highest expected and historically highest returning stocks were small value. But that only explained about two thirds of Buffett's success or his outperformance. So the academics kept trying to drill down and eventually found that there were two other characteristics. One, profitable stocks. So if you bought stocks with high return on assets, high return on equity, high gross margins that were high, and quality. So they had these other traits and more stable earnings. If you just bought an index of those stocks, you basically match Buffett's performance and his alpha, all his alpha performance virtually disappears. So his genius, not taking anything away from him because he figured this out five decades before the academics, was at identifying these traits. And Buffett has not outperformed the, these types of indices for the last 13 years or so. And the market has become much more efficient because at the managers, for example, used to be able to say, for example, when I wrote my first book in 98, if you bought small value stocks that were more profitable and higher quality, you could claim you were outperforming even on a risk-adjusted basis. But since 2013, you can't do that anymore. Because all the funds that I own and others own and their ETFs incorporate that and they buy all these stocks. So you have to make, we're able to benchmark it against an, a better measure. Okay, that is all I have for this year end episode. I just wanted to say thank you so much to everyone that has continued to support the channel. It truly means a lot to me. And one of my goals for this year is I want to make this community more interactive. And I've been getting more people reach out to me on my Instagram, which I absolutely love. So feel free to add me on there and reach out. I've updated my handle from Millennial Investing Podcast to Rebecca.Hotsko. 
So that's linked in the show notes. And feel free to message me anytime with topics you would like me to cover in future episodes, guest suggestions, or even just any investment or market questions you have. And then I can use that to find the best guests to come on the show to help answer them. I'm always interested to know what kind of content you guys like best and want to hear more of. So the best way is to reach me on Instagram. All right, that is all I have. I hope you guys enjoyed today's episode and I will see you again next week. I think it's helpful just to start with what an investor's goals are and what their tolerances or other considerations are. Are you trying to achieve higher returns than the market? Are you comfortable underperforming the market by 8% in one year if it means having higher expected returns than the market? I think these are the kind of considerations investors need to have.